Eagle 95.1, WUPN, Paradise, Sault Ste. Marie. It's time for the game. Eagle 95.1 proudly brings you the game. The Twin Zoo's only regional and national sports show. For the next hour, we'll get an in-depth look at sports in the Eastern Upper Peninsula and Algoma region and hear from coaches and players involved in the game. Now, let's join Scott Nason at the Wicked Sister on Ashman Street in downtown Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan for tonight's broadcast of the game on Eagle 95.1. Time to play the game. Time to play the game! <laughs> Glorious! No, I won't give in, I won't give in Till I'm victorious And I will defend, I will defend Greetings and salutations and welcome to the game on this Tuesday night, May 15th, 2018. My name is Scott Nason, host of the game, broadcasting from the studios of Eagle 95.1 WUPN in downtown Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan on this sunny but a little bit chillier night than we've seen over the past couple days. Lots going on in the world of local sports, which we will get our listeners caught up on now. We'll be joined in our next segment by Dave McKegg, host of the Game Sports Show in Sioux, Ontario from Boston Pizza and from Sports Center Barn Grill. Dave will talk a lot about the Sioux Greyhounds who were eliminated from the Ontario Hockey League Finals. We'll talk about that with Dave along with other local and regional sports items. And we'll be joined by Butch Davis from the Telegram News and the radio show Butch on Sports in our third segment as Butch will get us up to date on what's going on in the Detroit sports scene. And then we'll have our round table with Butch, hopefully Dave, and hopefully we'll get E.J. Russell in as well. And we usually broadcast from the Wicked Sister on Ashman Street, but we couldn't tonight due to prior commitments we'll be back there next tuesday night for a live broadcast so join us at the wicked sister next tuesday may 22nd for our live show and they have lots going on at the wicked sister right now including burger month throughout the entire month of may as each day they will serve a new and unique burger and this friday ladies night in downtown sault st marie michigan Wicked Sister will have lots of specials for the ladies, including highlighting some of their upcoming menu items for the summer and plenty of drink specials. And Kathy, owner of the Wicked Sister, tells me that roasted beet hummus with house-made spent grain crackers will be available on Friday. So ladies, Friday night is your night. Head down to the Wicked Sister. Well, we have lots of sports to cover here locally in our first segment And we'll begin with some breaking news today. Sources close to the game have confirmed that the new Sioux High head hockey coach will be Rick Mackey, assistant coach of the Sioux High Blue Devils. That announcement expected to be made official later on this week. Could be as early as tomorrow as Rick Mackey will be the next head coach for the 2018-2019 Sioux High Blue Devil hockey team, replacing John Ferroni. And so the coaching shuffle continues as far as coaches retiring and then having other coaches come in. Doug LaProd, the new coach of the Sioux Eagles. The Sioux Eagles had their tryout camp this past weekend at the Big Bear Arena. We'll talk about that in a moment. And so just breaking today, Rick Mackey, the new head coach of the Sioux High Blue Devil Hockey Team, somebody very familiar with the program. He's been involved for many years under, I believe, both Coach John Froney and Doug LaProd. And Rick knows the players he knows the the system, and my opinion, that was a very good pick by the brand new Suhai athletic director. That has not been named official, but I believe 
Sources have confirmed that Steve Lockwood is the new Sioux High Athletic Director. This is expected to become official later on this week. Could be as early as tomorrow, but Rick Mackey, the new head coach of the Sioux High Blue Devil hockey team. Well, we have lots of baseball and softball to talk about, along with track and field, which has happened over this past week. Let's recap it all, starting on last Tuesday, as Sioux High was at Newberry for a pair of baseball games. And the Sioux High Blue Devils swept the Newberry Indians to remain undefeated in a conference play. Sioux High won game one by the score of 15-1. to Shane Thompson and Hunter Conisette had two hits each for the Sioux High Blue Devils. Thompson would drive in five runs in the opener and collect the win, along with allowing just one run and striking out nine. The Blue Devils would win game two last Tuesday in Newberry by the score of 11-2. to Thompson had two hits and three RBIs in the nightcap. Jake Gates allowed two runs in six innings, striking out five for the Sioux High Blue Devils. Rudyard was at Sheboygan in another Straits Area Conference doubleheader last Tuesday, and it was a split as the Chiefs won game one by the score of 4-2, to two, and the Bulldogs came back for a 9-1 to one win in game two. Dylan Mills and Tanner Norton had two hits each for Rudyard in game one, while Spencer Peeple pitched five innings for the Bulldogs, gave up four runs, and Burton would earn the win in game two for Rudyard, giving up just one run and two hits in six innings, striking out nine. Softball on Tuesday in Sheboygan, and while the Straits Area Conference might have come down to this series, last year the Bulldogs won their first Straits Area Conference in, I think it was ever, but in recent memory. Well, it looks like Sheboygan could be this year's Straits Area Conference champion as they swept a very good Rudyard team on Tuesday by the scores of 12-2 and four to nothing as freshman hurler Morgan Brandu pitched both games, allowing just two runs in 12 innings and striking out 11 on the day. And that's a very good Red Yard team, which we'll talk about more here coming up. A team that's put up a lot of runs over this past week. Two or Wednesday in high school baseball, Newberry swept Brimley in Newberry by scores of two to nothing and 13 to three. In game one, it was Hunter Dennis completing a, uh, pitching rather, a complete game shutout, striking out 10. Nathan Magnuson was 3 for 3 for the Indians, while Newberry had 12 hits in game 2, including Cameron Depew going 3 for 3, and Dennis again perfect at the plate, going 2 for 2. Brendan Shornack went 2 for 3 for the Brimley Bays. Baseball on Thursday in Hillman. The Rudyard Bulldogs defeated Hillman by the score of 12 to 7 and 5 to 3. It was, it was James Burton going 3 for 3 in game 1 for Rudyard, hitting a home run and driving in 5. Dylan Mills had 3 hits and scored 3 runs while he had a double in game 2. Robert Molaski and Tanner Norton pitched in the nightcap. The Rudyard Bulldogs and Hillman Tigers split in softball. Rudyard won the first game 16-9 and fell 14-13 in the nightcap. Everyone in the lineup had a hit for Rudyard in game one with Emily Curtis hitting two home runs and knocking in five. Morgan Bickle and Lauren Royer had three hits each for Rudyard. Bickle was three for four with a home run for Rudyard in game two as the Bulldogs tallied 15 hits in that one. Friday, Sioux High lost a pair of games in high school baseball to Gladstone by the scores of 3 to nothing and 11 to 3. And lots of baseball over the weekend on Saturday, Sioux High split at Escanaba as the Blue Devils defeated Bark River Harris 6 to 1 in their opener on Saturday. Shane Thompson hit two doubles and had three RBIs in game 1. And Jacob Gates earned the win, allowing just one run on five hits. Escanaba would win the second game of the day for the Sioux High Blue Devils as they topped Sioux High by the score of 6-4. to four. Gates was 2-4 of four for the Sioux, and Logan Bailey also went 2-4. of four. Brimley was at Pickford, and the Brimley Bays swept Pickford. A little bit of a surprise there. In high school baseball, the Bays won the opening game on Saturday 3-1. to one. Jake Hopper had two RBIs and a double for Brimley. And he also earned the win on the mound, pitching six innings and allowing just one run on three hits and striking out eight. In game two, the Bays would score four runs in the top of the seventh to win by the score of eight to six. 
Brendan Shornack hit a three-run homer for Brimley in Game 2. Rudyard were scheduled to play both their baseball and softball invitationals in Rudyard, but they canceled those a couple weeks ago due to the field, and they weren't sure if the field was going to improve or be ready by then. So the both teams went down to Ross Common. We'll talk about the baseball team now and then get to the softball team. Rudyard's baseball team won two games in Ross Common. They beat the host Ross Common Bucks by the score of 6-1. to one. Trent McDowell and James Burton were both 2-for-2 two for, two for the Bulldogs in that opener. Cole Besteman and McDowell had two RBIs each. McDowell started and earned the win in the first game. The Bulldogs also won the second game over Mayo Asabo by the score of 6-2. to two. Softball on Thursday, or rather on Saturday, it was Pickford sweeping the Brimley Bays, winning game one by the score of 12-5 to five in five innings. Torrey Thermos earned the win for Pickford on the mound, while Paula Walden took the loss for Brimley. Liberty Bailey had two hits for Pickford in game one, and Pickford would continue to slam the ball hard on Saturday as they defeated Brimley in the second game by the score of 20-3 to three in three innings. Bailey earned the win for Pickford. She also had three hits to help her cause, including a triple, and Grace May had a grand slam for the Pickford Cedarville Pirates on Saturday. And then there were several games also played on Monday, yesterday, in beautiful weather conditions. It was Pickford Cedarville taking on Rudyard in high school baseball, and those teams split yesterday afternoon in Pickford. Rudyard won game one by the score of 5-2. to two. Noel M- McLeod hit a double and had a single and drove in two runs for Rudyard, while James Burton and Tanner Norton added two hits each. Burton earned the win on the mound for the Bulldogs, pitching six, allowing just two runs on three hits while striking out five, and Blaine Burnaby homered for the Pirates in game one. The PC Pirates would win game two yesterday over Rudyard by the score of 11-6. to six. Isaac Brown was 3 of 4 for the Pirates, while Nick Eddington had a pair of hits. Burnaby and Lane Warner had two RBIs each, and Jimmy Story earned the win for the Pirates. And the Rudyard Bulldogs are in action as we speak at home. Their first home games, if you can believe it, on May 15th as they are hosting Ellsberg. Brimley Bays hosted Wolverine, and it was all Bays on Monday as they, I believe those were their first home games. I could be mistaken there, but it's taken a while for both Rudyard and Brimley to get on their home fields. Well, the Brimley Bays made up for lost time on Monday as they crushed Wolverine in Game 1 by the score of 20 to nothing in two innings. Sam Hopper had a home run for the Bays in five RBIs, while Sean Hill went 4-4-4. Four for four. And the Bays also would win Game 2 by the score of 15 to nothing in three innings. Ty Miller had a triple, single, and two RBIs for Brimley. High school softball on Monday. couple games to report. I was down in St. Ignace umpiring the Pelston and St. Ignace softball games. And a vastly improved St. Ignace team. This is a team that's kind of been on the uh, bottom rung of the Straits Area Conference, but they've done a nice job, and they have a nice young group of underclassmen, both at the JV level and the varsity level. It was a couple entertaining games. The Saints were down 17-4 to to Pelston. They rally and win 18-17, to and the Saints would fall in the nightcap by the score of 3-2. to Rudyard crushed, and I mean crushed, Pickford Cedarville. On Monday, they won two games. The first game winning by the score of 30-2. to They had an 18-run fifth inning and had 27 hits in the opener. Emily Curtis, 4-4 four for, four for the Bulldogs, including two RBI, or rather two doubles and four RBIs. Bailey Van Sloten, Jordan Spring, Sierra Molina, Lane Clegg, and Autumn Lemmerman had three hits each. Emily Curtis earned the win on the mound, allowing two runs on four hits while striking out six. The Bulldogs would continue to play well yesterday, winning the nightcap in Pickford by the score of 16 to nothing in three innings. Haley Van Sloten had a home run and a single, while Madison McDowell had a pair of doubles. Paige Postma earned the win for the Bulldogs, allowing just one hit. The Bulldogs would split this past weekend in Ross Common, losing 4 to 3 and 17 to 3, and they are in action right now, taking on Ellsworth, their home opener, also in Rudyard. Track and field from this past week, uh, Cedarville's sophomore Thomas Bone broke Nick Schladig's school record in the 1600 on Tuesday at the Bay Mills Community College Invite, turning in a winning time of 4 minutes 35 seconds as the 
Cedarville sophomore broke that record. He also won the 800. The signature race at the meet was the 3200, which was designated as such because Bay Mills tribal members Melvin Willis, Lynette Clark hold Brimley boys and girls school records in that event. Austin Plotkin of Brimley and Zoya Tor of Cedarville were the boys and girls 3,200 winners on Tuesday, and they both received trophies to commemorate the event. The Panthers would win the boys' meet on Tuesday. Brimley was runner-up, and Rudyard took third. John Lamoth of Pickford captured the 100 dash. Event winners for the Panthers included David Nabak in the 110 hurdles, Joey Boyk in the long jump, Nick Eddington in the high jump, Colby Carpenter in the discus, and Garrett Dodds in shot put. The Panthers would also finish first in the 1600 relay. Brimley's Caleb Johansson won the 300 hurdles, and Plotkin took first in the 3200. The Bays would also win the 400, 800, and 3200 relays for the boys. Brimley would win the girls' meet while Pickford was second and Cedarville was third. Brimley's Caitlin Kroll won the 100 dash, and Kaylee Gambardella won the 200. Gambardella, Lillian Thomas, Kroll, and Abel LaRue won the 800 and 1600 relays. Ivory Maxwell, Caden Johnson, Kroll, and LaRue won the 400 relay, all Brimley runners. Taylor Apolko of Pickford won the 100 hurdles and long jump. Cedarville's Cassidy Barr was a double winner in the 800 and 1600, while Mackenzie Barr won the discus and shot put. And Sydney Zurp of Rudyard won the 300 hurdles, while Sierra Burton of Detour took first in the high jump. Sioux High track and field teams, both the boys and the girls, would win in Manistique this past Tuesday. The boys finished first in the seventh school meet while Newberry was second and Sheboygan was third. Caleb Branta was a double winner for Sioux High, winning the 800 and 1600. Parker Rutledge, Hunter Walther, Jacob Hopkins, and Jaron Wyma took first in the 3200 relay for Sioux High. Tucker Shepard of St. Ignace won the 110 hurdles and the 300 hurdles, while the Saints' Joe Kelly also won the shot put. Sioux High would win the girls' meet in Manistique on Tuesday, St. Ignace second. Manistique third. Sioux High's Lily Scheid won the 100 and 300 hurdles. Event winners for the Sioux also included Jordan Scott in the 100 dash, Megan Arbick in the 3200, and Emily McLean in the shot put. The Saints would have a couple winners as well. The 1600 relay team, Emily Koivu would win the 200 and 400, while Libby Beck Baker, Becker rather, won the 800 and 1600, and Heather Lamb won the long jump, Lenny Gustafson winning the high jump. More track and field over this past week on Thursday. The Sioux High Blue Devils would finish first in the large division at the East Jordan Invite. First place finishers for the Blue Devils included Val Gage in the discus and Madison Hornstra, Megan Arbick, Shelley Evo, and Haley Knowles in the 3200 relay. Soccer from this past weekend, or week I should say, on Wednesday, Suhai was blanked at Marquette by the score of one to nothing. That's the only track and field results that I received throughout this week, but there is more local sports information. We'll be talking here in a few minutes with Dave McKegg about the Sioux Greyhounds, the Ontario Hockey League, the RBC Cup, and some of the other local hockey notes. I was able to attend the Sioux Eagles tryout camp. My good friend Don Supa and his daughter Chloe and I got to see some of the uh, players who are participating for the Sioux Eagles. This is their first tryout camp. They're going to have another tryout camp in the Chicago area later on, and of course their main camp in August. But over 50 players participated in this past weekend's Eagles camp at the Big Bear Arena. Familiar names included Eagles from last season, including Bobby Price, Mahali C., Kyle Quinn, Hayden Clark, Matt Capasciolto, Jake Palmario, Alex Schwab, and Brendan Blair. Some other local players participated, hoping to catch the eye of New Eagles head coach Doug LaProd and general manager Bruno Braganolo, including Sioux High Blue Devils, Nate Jeffries, Aaron Bambacco, Logan Raphael, along with Robbie Landis and Drake McColo. And so, already, preparations are underway for the 2018-2019 season for the Sioux Eagles and really across the junior hockey area. There was a rule change by the Michigan High School Athletic Association which has caught some attention as they have adopted revised regulations for student athletes looking to transfer. The revised transfer regulation will go into effect for the 2019-20 school year based on a student's athlete's sports participation during 2018-19, which is next season. The new transfer rule will make transferring student athletes ineligible for one year 
used to be six months. Now it's going to be one entire year in any sport played during the previous years at the previous school, unless that student-athlete situation fits of the current 15 exceptions that allow for immediate eligibility. However, the revised transfer regulation also allows that transferring students immediately eligible in any other MHSAA sponsored sport not participated in during that previous year at the previous school. What they're trying to do, especially in the Metro Detroit area, is getting people, stopping them from transfer, bouncing from school to school. They're trying to make it harder to do that, it appears. The additions to the transfer rule received vast support from member schools and surveys leading up to the council's vote. Quote, we are hopeful the sport-specific transfer rule will be easier to understand and therefore more consistently enforced, said MHSA Executive Director John Roberts. This rule better addresses the changing landscape of transfers, hoping dissuading those considering moving for athletic reasons while still allowing a full range of sports for those who do switch. It may seem like a punishment to some, but the new rule is actually more permissive for many transfer students. We saw growing support for these changes from our schools, and we began discussing this proposal a year ago. That according to Jack Roberts of the MHSAA. We'll maybe see what Butch Davis has to say about that, as that's a little more in his area. We don't see it too much up here, but you see it a lot in the Metro Detroit area. Lake State making some news this past week, and actually it made news on 9 and 10 News, and really kind of talking around town. I try to avoid all the rants and raves, if you will, that uh, some people seem to enjoy. I'm, I'm not a big uh, fan of the rants and raves, but I'm a big fan of swimming. And uh, some sad news, in my opinion, as far as the swimming pool at Lake State. Lake Superior State University's Board of Trustees approved a plan during its May 11th public meeting to convert the James Norris Center Notatorium area, the pool, into a state-of-the-art court complex that will be used for volleyball, e-sport events, and basketball. Now, Lake State is officially going to close the pool on July 31st of this year. President Dr. Peter Mitchell cited finances of keeping the pool open and federally mandated parity between men's and women's sports as main drivers for the North Space Realignment Initiative, the details of which will be defined in the coming months. Mitchell said it costs over $140,000 to operate the pool annually, and a recent assessment by the Federal Office of Civil Rights, or OCR, found that LSSU had no comparable program for women as with the NCAA men's Division I hockey team. Mitchell said they are focusing on volleyball as a premier Division II sport at LSSU. The Laker volleyball team coming off a 3-22 season this past year. Plans call for the auditorium to be closed on July 31st for transformation into a surfaced area for volleyball, basketball, and intramurals. There will also be an extensive renovation and expansion of locker rooms for teams in the general public along with the creations of lofts, which are similar to the ones you see at the Taffy Able Arena, with one side overlooking the new volleyball court and the other side overlooking the Bud Cooper Gymnasium. Finally, an area for eSports will be created at the far end of the volleyball court. Now, these are participatory competitions played on screens the size of a wall, much like the fallout, apparently, that my son likes to play at every chance he gets. I don't know if that's going to be part of these eSports, but could be one example. And bleachers will be there for fans to watch. Mitchell added that the North Center decision came by recommendation from a university task force and then communicated to a group of community leaders representing the city, school district, recreation, and economic development. Now, this kind of came as a surprise to me. I was not privy to any of this information, so I don't fall into any of the community leaders and city and district and such, but it is sad on the note that the pool will be closed. But I guess when you have financial considerations to do, you got to do what's got to be done, but it's going to cause a potential real problem with the swimming programs here locally. We have some very good young men and women, the SCAT program, the high school swimming program. You have exceptional athletes. We've interviewed several on this show, including Sue High Head Coach Steve Abusta. And at last night's school board meeting, the pool once again on the chopping block. Now, this has been something that's been happening for the past few years. And, well, I certainly hope that both pools do not get closed. Now, that is the potential, and, boy, that would just be an absolute death blow to the swimming program and this community. And so one pool closing, 
Hopefully the Suhai pool stays open. I know there's going to be a lot of people upset about that if it's closed. The school's got to find some money somewhere. There is money out there, in my opinion. Laker Hockey released their 2018-29 schedule this past week. It can it includes 37 games, six non-conference tilts, three exhibition contests, and the standard 28 WCHA matchups. A total of 16 games will be played inside Taffy Able Arena this season. The Lakers will open up the season with a non-conference series on the road at Merrimack, October 6th and 7th. The following weekend, LSSU will host Nipissing in an exhibition series, October 12th and 13th. WCHA play begins October 26th and 27th. Lake State will travel to Alabama Huntsville for a two-game set. On November 2nd and 3rd, the Lakers will celebrate Great Lakes State Weekend Homecoming Weekend as it welcomes Michigan inside the Taffy Able Arena for a non-conference series. Following the series with the Wolverines, the Lakers will play five straight WCHA weekend matchups with four games against Alaska Fairbanks and two game sets with Bowling Green, Northern Michigan, and Minnesota State. December 16th, LSSU is slated to take on the USA Under-18 development team in Plymouth, and the 2018 portion of the schedule wraps up with the Great Lakes Invitational, the 54th annual as the Lakers will take on Michigan State at Little Caesars Arena, Michigan will take on Michigan Tech in the other one. The Lakers are coming off a ninth place finish in the WCHA with a record of 10-22-4. One of two teams in the country not making the playoffs. And just on March 1st, with a four-year record of 43-90-18, head coach Damon Winton was rewarded with a four-year contract extension. Well, that's going to cover this segment's edition of Local Sports. Boy, a few weeks ago when we weren't getting any games in, we were complaining, where are the local sports? Well, as you heard, they are alive and well. Coming up in our next segment, we'll be talking to Dave McKegg about the Sioux Greyhounds and their tough finish to the season. Dave and I got to attend game, game 5 at the SR Center, and, well, lots to talk about the Sioux Greyhounds. We'll also get uh, involved in some news of a local 32-year-old gentleman from Sioux, Ontario, just named general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. How about that? Kyle Dubas, congratulations to him. We're going to talk about that, and we'll get into some national sports with Dave. We'll talk about the NHL playoffs, Winnipeg, Vegas. That series tied at 1, Tampa and, and Washington, the Caps. Up 2-0. to oh, We'll talk about the Raptors and the firing of their coach despite winning 59 games. The NBA playoffs. We'll maybe even get some Blue Jays talk in there. And then we'll talk to Butch Davis after that from the Telegram News and Butch on Sports about what's going on in the Detroit sports scene. Lots going on there as well. You have Mike Patricia and uh, allegations from 20-some-odd years ago. You got the Tigers two games back of Cleveland in the AL Central. They were supposed to have 100 losses by now, weren't they? We'll talk about that with Butch and more, and then we'll have a roundtable in our final portion tonight. And one of the topics I'm excited to talk about, the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes, on a sports show, we're going to talk about the U.S. Supreme Court. They had a very important ruling on Monday that's going to change the landscape of sports betting. We're going to talk about that as well on the roundtable, along with other sports, and then we'll have our thumbs up and thumbs down. If you want to hear all our shows of the game, including this one, Boston Pizza, Sports Center Bar and Grill, Butch on Sports, my segments with Paul Van Wagner on the drive on ESPN Blacksburg, and other sports-related material, go to the podcast page of this show, thegamesportshow.podbean.com. And our website, thegamesportshow.com, we're just finishing up the last touches. We're going to have a lot on there, including merchandise, Dave McKay and Northern Critters. We've done some shirts up. we got our pictures coming out, a whole bunch of things going on on the game. We're going to have another show from the Wicked Sister next Tuesday, and then we'll shift back to Monday night's starting in June. We're going to take our first break on the game. When we come back, we're going to hear from Mr. Electric Avenue himself, Dave McKegg. That's coming up next on the game here on Eagle 95.1. Get Wicked Catering from the crew at the Wicked Sister. We like to think of ourselves as foodies. While our favorite foods are paired with a beer tasting at the Wicked Sister, you can now have the same creative menu for your next catered business luncheon, family get-together, wedding, or holiday party. Our white truffle risotto appeals to your gluten-free and vegetarian guests. Add sautéed shrimp or freshly grilled chicken for a pop of protein. Or let us build you a custom menu to suit your needs. From plated events of 15 to buffets for 200, the Wicked Sister will cater your event with tapas, snacks, craveables, or a full sit-down dinner. The Wicked Sister, where you'll be treated like family, whether you like it or not. The Game Sports Show would like to thank an additional home to the Game Sports Show. 
Canadian franchise Boston Pizza. Boston Pizza, Sault Ste. Marie, located on 601 Great Northern Road, Sault Ste. Marie. Come in and join Boston Pizza for its numerous specials that are offered. After 9 p.m. daily, come in to Boston Pizza for $9 schooners, $4 rail drinks, and delicious food. Boston Pizza, Sault Ste. Marie, you're among friends. The Game Sports Show would like to thank an additional sponsor and additional home to the Game Sports Show, Sports Center Bar and Grill. Sports Center Bar and Grill, located on 624 Wellington Street West, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Sports Center rated top sports bar for the second year in a row. At Sports Center, enjoy their famous 75-cent wing night along with delicious Molson products on tap, along with a great atmosphere and other great food options available as well. Sports Center Bar and Grill, the Sioux's best sports bar. Thank you for tuning in to the game. Heard Monday nights from the Wicked Sister on Ashman Street on Eagle 95.1. Also online at RadioEagleSue.com and the podcast page, The Game Sports Show. Dot podbean.com. I hope you're enjoying the broadcast. Now, if you want to hear more of the Twin Sioux's only local, regional, and national talk show, I encourage you to visit our website at thegamesportshow.com, and you can tune into a pair of broadcasts of the Game Sports Show from Sioux, Ontario. Our co-host here on the game, Mr. Electric Avenue Dave McKegg, broadcasts the show on Wednesday night from Sports Center Bar and Grill in Sioux, Ontario, along with his regular contributors, Jamie Antonello, Justin Heichel, and Dave. Dane Hantro. They focus on football with their in the pocket segment talking about the NFL along with basketball and the NBA and other sports including tennis, golf, soccer and the WWE. If you like hockey, Thursday nights are for you as the game sports show is broadcasting from Boston Pizza in Sioux, Ontario with Dave McKegg along with his regular contributors Justin Heichel and Dane Hantro. Now this show focuses on hockey in the winter time and baseball in the summer and will include guests and interviews from local and national figures. Once again, you can hear three versions of the game at our website, thegamesportshow.com, or at the podcast page, thegamesportshow.podbean.com. Also on the podcast page, you will find selected audio broadcasts of Sioux Eagles home games, Brimley Bay's basketball, and Sioux High Blue Devil hockey, along with game contributor Butch Davis and his broadcasts of Butch on Sports. You can also find us on YouTube. Look for the Scott Nason channel. Thank you for listening, and keep it locked here to the game for all your local, regional, and national sports talk that you just can't get enough of. The Game Sports Show would like to thank a list of additional sponsors. North Shore Sports and Auto, new location located on 647 McDonald Avenue, Sault Ste. Marie, a family-owned and operated business with doing business in Sault Ste. Marie for over 10 years. Loads of products available for your enjoyment for all seasons. North Shore Sports and Auto, we understand the importance of quality service and products, and we work hard to ensure that all customers have a positive experience before and after each and every sale. North Shore Sports and Auto, meeting all of your new and pre-owned equipment needs. Special thanks to the Salon. The Salon, located on 589 Second Line East, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, owned and operated by Mike Cuglietta. Book your appointment today at 705-941-9191 or via online at https colon dash dash the Salon Sioux dot as dot me dash the salon making the suit beautiful one haircut at a time as well as a shout out to the superior pro shop the superior pro shop located inside a community first credit union superior arena on 285 northern avenue east to st marie ontario owned and operated by jeremy paquin and ran by larry monroe the superior pro shop for over 40 years meet all of your skate sharpening skate repair and hockey needs Welcome back to the game on Eagle 95.1. Scott Nason broadcasting from our studios on Ashman Street on this Tuesday night. And I do have to uh, apologize to our listeners. We were scheduled to be joined by Dave McKegg along with Butch Davis and EJ Russell. Unfortunately, we have uh, some technical malfunctions with our recording software on Skype, which is what we use to uh, talk to our out-of-town contributors. And so we did a segment with each, and unfortunately it didn't record. So you're stuck with me tonight on the game. Uh, but we will paraphrase or recap what we discussed uh, during our discussions. Unfortunately, the audio evidence will not be there. But I'll do my best to paraphrase. We'll get all the bugs worked out. You know, with technology, sometimes things don't work perfectly. But I want to thank Dave McKegg, Butch Davis, and EJ Russell, who are ready to 
it going. Had some great content. Unfortunately, uh, computers and uh, different programs did not work out. So we will get those bugs fixed and definitely have the gentleman back next week. But we're going to recap some of the things that I wanted to discuss uh, on the local front, along with Detroit and Toronto sports and the roundtable. Starting with the Sioux Greyhounds. The Hounds fell in the Ontario Hockey League final to the Hamilton Bulldogs on Sunday by the score of 5-4 to four in Game 6. As Hamilton wins that best of seven series, four games to two, Robert Thomas's 12th goal of the playoffs was the backbreaker for the Hounds, who had a 2-0 lead in the first period, at the end of the first period, but Hamilton came back, and they knocked the Sioux Greyhounds out of the playoffs as Matthew Villalta made 32 saves in the loss, but he gave up a couple key goals in that third period. And so the Sioux Greyhounds, a brilliant 55-win regular season, one of the best in OHL history, which included a 23-game winning streak, also had a run of 29 straight without losing in regulation. They were the number one ranked team in the Canadian Hockey League. But they fall to Hamilton. Uh, Dave and I had a chance to go to that game five at the SR Center on Friday. And the Hounds really came out flat. And it just was not their night. They got down five to one. They came back, stormed back in that third period, cut the deficit to one. But Hamilton would get an empty net goal, taking a 3-2 series lead back to Hamilton and well, Hamilton's a good team, and you look at this Hounds team, so much talent, and it's going to be hard to get back to the level that they're at right now. Can they get back? I think they can. Will it take time? Absolutely, because teams like the Greyhounds and some other maybe uh, smaller market teams don't have the luxury as the Kitcheners and the Londons who seem to be up on top year after year. It's going to be a rebuild for the Hounds and their general manager, Kyle Raftis, but you look at this series against Hamilton, several things to me stood out in talking with Dave. Uh, he, he mentioned quite a few things as well as this Hamilton team beat the Hounds. It wasn't that the Hounds beat themselves. Hamilton beat this team. Hamilton was a very experienced club that was built for the playoffs. They were fresher. They had three five-game series. The Hounds had two seven-game series, and it was in a tougher division. Hounds, that Owen Sound series, the second round series that went seven, that was a tough series, and that took a lot out of the Hounds. Then they go against Kitchener. Again, another seven-game series. They lose Hayden Verbeek in that series with a broken wrist in game two, and the Hounds just looked like they were out of gas. Hamilton was fresher. They were more physical. They had a lot of experience. And I really thought they were hungrier than the Hounds. And that's not a knock against the Sioux Greyhounds. I mean, these are 16- to 20-year-old kids, and we don't want to be too overly critical on this show. You can hear that elsewhere. But they were not as hungry as Hamilton, in my opinion. And it showed in some of the play, in, especially that Game 5, one I had a chance to attend. And you see a lot more when you attend a game and, and watch the full scope of things. The Hounds just ran into a buzzsaw in Hamilton. And so Hamilton will advance to the Memorial Cup which will be played uh, starting Friday night in Regina, Saskatchewan. They'll take on the host Regina Pats. The other team from the WHL, the Swift Current Broncos, they'll take on the Acadie Bathurst Titans from the Quebec League. And I found it very ironic that Swift Current was the team that made it to the Memorial Cup this year. Of course, Swift Current back in 1986 was uh, involved in a tragedy, uh, killing four of their players. And this year, the Humboldt Broncos Awful, awful tragedy that happened, what, a couple months ago where they lost 16 members of the hockey club. You go back to 1986 when that Swift Current team had their tragedy. The Humboldt Broncos won the RBC Cup, and wouldn't it be something if the Swift Current Broncos win this year's Memorial Cup? So that'll start this weekend. Great season for the Sioux Greyhounds. Unfortunately, a tough ending to the year. And our good friend Don Supa, who listens each and every week, I remember back in the nineteen, or excuse me, the two thousand six World Series. Both of us Tiger fans. The Tigers get there unexpectedly, and I wasn't that upset when they lost in the World Series. And I remember Don saying right after, "It's like, dude, it's tough to get back to the World Series." Well, the Tigers have been back, but they haven't won, and it's going to take a while for the Sioux Greyhounds to win. So, good season for the Hounds. I know Dave had a lot to say. You can listen to his show Thursday night from Boston Pizza, and he will tell you a lot more about the Sioux Greyhounds and their season. 
The RBC Cup going on right now as we speak in Chilliwack, British Columbia, and the representative from this region, the Wellington Dukes, defeated Steinbeck last night by the score of 3-2. to two. They are one of three teams that are 1-1 one one in that tournament, host Chilliwack, along with the Ottawa Junior Senators and Wellington, all 1-1, one and one, while the only undefeated team right now, the Wenatchee Wild, 2-0 and oh in the tournament, and Steinbeck 0-2. Oh and games going on right now. Ottawa is taking on Wenatchee, and Wellington is taking on host Chilliwack. Moving on to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Dave had a lot to say about this, and he'll have more to say on Thursday night on his show, the Game Sports Show, which you can hear on the podcast page, thegamesportshow.podbean.com, or by going to the website, thegamesportshow.com, as 32-year-old Sioux, Ontario native Kyle Dubas was promoted this past Friday, to the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. As the former Sioux Greyhounds general manager and Sioux native, who joined the team as an assistant general manager in 2014, succeeds 75-year-old Lou Lamorello. Lamorello shifted to the role of senior advisor last month. Most expected President Brendan Shannon, Shanahan to choose Dubas or Mark Hunter or another jam with the team. As the Maple Leafs chose Mr. Dumas, who was the general manager of the team's AHL affiliate, the Toronto, Toronto Marlies, and responsible for a lot of these players that are currently playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So a nice story there. Kyle Dubas, named general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Not bad for a 32-year-old kid from Sioux, Ontario, that used to hang around the rinks. So congratulations to Kyle, and we wish him best of luck here on the Game Sports Show. NHL playoffs going on tonight. Game three between the Washington Capitals and the Tampa Bay Lightning. And it was the Capitals winning both games in Tampa over the weekend, taking a 2 nothing series lead in that one. Game three underway right now. No score early as we record this show. And so Washington and Tampa. Liam, I need you to quiet down. I'm recording a show. Liam, you're too loud. Liam. Liam! You need to quiet down. You're, I'm recording a show. Tampa Bay is going to need to win four out of five games if they're going to come back in that series. And so pretty much a must win for the Tampa Bay Lightning in Washington as the Capitals playing loose as they got the proverbial monkey off their back against the Pittsburgh Penguins, defeating the Penguins in that series. And so my Stanley Cup pick was Tampa and Winnipeg. Right now, Tampa looking the shakier of the two. In the West, head coach Paul Maurice, Sioux Ontario native and guest on the Game Sports Show with Dave McKegg, is tied with his team, the Winnipeg Jets, 1-1 in his series against Vegas. Game 3 will be tomorrow night in Vegas. Vegas with a big 3-1 win at Winnipeg. And so there you have it. That is your update in the NHL playoffs. And... Dave had a lot to say about the Toronto Blue Jays tonight as the Blue Jays 21 and 23rd place in the AL East. You can hear more of Dave's comments on the Blue Jays on his show, the Game Sports Show. We had a chance to talk to Butch Davis tonight. Again, unfortunately, the recording software didn't work out. However, he'll have a lot to say on his show this week, Butch on Sports, which will be back starting tomorrow night and you can find that show again on this podcast page the game sports show.podbean.com which will po- talk about the detroit tigers currently two games out of the al central they're taking on cleveland right now cleveland having their way with the tigers tonight on this tuesday night as they are leading five to one in the top of the fifth inning but the tigers despite a lot of injuries a kind of a patchwork lineup Still in contention in mid-May, and I think most people at the beginning of the year would have taken that as far as the Detroit Tigers still in contention in the AL Central. Butch will have a lot more to say about that on Butch on Sports, which you can find on the podcast page of this show. Butch had also some things to say about the Detroit Lions and head coach Matt Patricia, who we found out last week uh, due to some reporting, was involved in a situation back when he was 21 years old involving... um, an allegation which never made it to trial. It looks like he has survived as far as the the media coverage and scrutiny. The Lions currently participating in OTAs, and Butch will have more to say about the Lions. The Detroit Pistons and the NBA draft. Uh, the Pistons, of course, in the hunt for a new head coach as well as president of basketball operations. Butch will talk more about that as well on his show. 
The Pistons will get a first-round draft pick if the Clippers finish in the top four of the draft lottery, but I don't think that's going to happen. And Butch will have a lot more to say about that, as well as the Red Wings waiting for the NHL draft. And head coach Jeff Blaschel currently involved with the U.S. national team in the World Championships in Belgium. The USA will take on the Czech Republic in the quarterfinals of that one. Dave also wanted to talk about the Toronto Raptors and the firing of their head coach. And so the Raptors will be in the hunt for a head coach as well. NBA playoffs going on. Game three. Game two, rather, between the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Boston Celtics. The Celtics with a big win in game one. And game two will start here in a few minutes in Boston. I would expect a little better effort from the Cleveland Cavaliers. Also, the Golden State Warriors won game one last night over Houston in the West Finals. Game two will be tomorrow night in Houston. So those are some of the sports that we covered on the game. And a couple other things that I wanted to mention. One of the big national stories that I really wanted to talk about on the roundtable involves the U.S. Supreme Court paving the way for states to legalize sports betting. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled on Monday in a New Jersey case that may change the equation in not just the state of Michigan but across the USA. The justices ruled that a 25-year-old federal law that has effectively prohibited sports betting outside Nevada by forcing states to keep prohibitions on the prohibitions on books is unconstitutional. So this will set the stage for potentially other states to expand legalized gambling as a source of government revenue. While the U.S. paved the way on Monday, sports betting in Michigan still has a ways to go as there are some proposals but no action on expanding sports gambling in the state. Now there are currently eight bills that would expand gambling in the state that several would legalize sports betting and wagers on fantasy sports. And so we're going to watch the, how this develops, but this really will change the way sports betting is done in the United States. In my opinion, I think it's a great move for anybody that sports bets on sports, I should say. And this happens in other countries, and things seem to be just fine. You look in Canada, the government of Ontario has the pro line where you can bet on NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball, NFL, MLS, and other sports. And you see sports betting in Europe happening all the time. And, you know, you do have the odd story or two. You see it in professional tennis where they have had some things. Even the world of soccer has been littered. And you're always going to have the gamblers involved in sports. Go back to the Black Sox of the late 19-teens where uh, the eight men out, the movie that chronicled that. So I think this is a good move. I wouldn't mind uh, laying down a few bucks here and there on some uh, sports, maybe at a local casino or just on a lottery. So we're going to see the way this one plays out. And we'll talk more about this when we get everything sorted out on the roundtable. But those were some of the things I wanted to talk about. One other thing I wanted to mention, and Dave mentioned it during our segment earlier today, is uh, the GameSportsShow.com is going to be featuring our brand new shirts. Yes, we have merchandise. These shirts look great. And Dave's going to talk more about this on his show Thursday, but we'll have it online at thegamesportshow.com. My thumbs up and thumbs down for the week. I got nothing but thumbs up. I'm going to give a big thumbs up to Master P. That's right, Master P. If you remember back in the late 90s, make you go on and on and on. I got to go further than that. He's throwing his hat into the ring for the vacant head coaching position with the Toronto Raptors. Master P, whose real name is Percy Miller, says, I think I'd be the perfect coach for Toronto because I understand the team. I understand the players. Toronto has two all-stars, and you look at it right now, and it's like you should have went farther in the playoffs. Hey, you know what? Makes sense to me. There's your guy, Toronto Raptors. Raptors, Master P. Maybe we'll call him the, the I don't even know what I'm going to say right now. Maybe we'll call him the Toronto Master P Raptors. Somehow I don't think he's going to get the nod, but hey, way to, way to throw your hat in the ring, Master P. Thumbs up as well to Sue High and head coach Rick Mackey. I think it was a fantastic pick as far as him and potentially doing some great things with these Sioux High Blue Devils, continuing the tradition set forth by several coaches before him. And thumbs down to my recording system tonight. My goodness, get all these guys lined up. No time this week. The only night I could do the show, and the recording system went kaput. So 
It is what it is, and we will try to fix it and do better next week. Speaking of next week, we'll be back at the Wicked Sister on Tuesday night starting at 6 o'clock for another edition of the game. And Dave McKegg will have his shows this week online at thegamesportshow.podbean.com. And Butch Davis will also have his show back starting tomorrow night on the podcast page, thegamesportshow.podbean.com. That's going to do it for our abbreviated edition of the game. I want to thank Kathy and the staff at the Wicked Sister for sponsoring us. Don't forget Ladies Night Friday night from 4 to 8 downtown Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, as the Wicked Sister will have plenty of specials. And it's Burger Month at the Wicked Sister, so every day they're featuring a new burger. I want to thank Dave, Butch, and EJ, who was hoping to join us. We'll get them back on next week here on the game from Eagle 95.1.